afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the September, really second Monday, because the first Monday was a holiday. Um, and we have, as you can see, a, a panel which is going to be speaking on the topic, State and Art of Digital Diplomacy. And there are a number of new things that are happening starting this month, but one of them is, you'll see there's a different website up. It's not the PDC, and it's not USC. This is the Public Diplomacy Alumni Association, which as of today, becomes a full partner in these monthly programs. And so, without further ado, let me uh, turn the microphone over to Cynthia Efford, the president of PDAA. Thanks a lot, Adam. I think that this is a, an important new step forward. Um, the two organizations, for those of you who don't know, and the, we've put some, some information in the back about PDAA. Uh, the PDC, as you know, besides its wonderful academic connections with USC, uh, is an advocacy organization. Uh, PDAA is an affinity, and also uh, we provide the awards for current practitioners of public diplomacy. We fundraise and we do that. We have four afternoon lunches. So although our missions are somewhat different, we are united with our academic friends, GW, American University, USC, and others, in uh, supporting the study and practice of public diplomacy. And so I think it's uh, useful that we are now working even more closely together. So thanks very much to PDC for uh, allowing us to participate. And as I said, uh, our information, including how to sign up for PDAA, is in the back. Um, but we have an event. There's information in the back on uh, the end of the month. We will have a program over at Decor House. Our lunches are over there. And there's information in the back, which is on public diplomacy in an age of false news. Fake news. Fake news. So uh, th we have a few spaces left for people who are members and for those of you who are not members but might like to come anyway uh, let me know and you'll have to pay but i will be happy to sponsor you as as uh, one of my guests be so as i said i think the more that we are working together the more that we're sharing the information and the more that we uh, are a visible company of supporters of public diplomacy uh, the better. So, fortunately, my first very pleasant assignment is to introduce another strong supporter of public diplomacy and working on uh, the underpinnings, and that's, of course, Sean Powers, who is the Executive Director of the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Depar Diplomacy at the U.S. Department of State. And uh, in the constellation, constellation of people who do first-rate work, uh, the uh, Advisory Commission is probably at the top, the star. Um, Sean was, has been a, a director of, the, of this. He has a PhD from the Annenberg School of the University of Southern California for more than a decade. So he is representing all aspects of that constellation or a product of it. Uh, he has been working for more than a decade on uh, the public diplomacy, on development, and national security, and how they intersect. In uh, 2003, he was at CSIS, working on international security. 2004, he went off to USC uh, to do research uh, and graduate work on international broadcasting and global media. In 2010, he became a professor at Georgia State University and is responsible for setting up and the success of their Center for Global uh, Information Studies. He's now on leave. Um, we probably shouldn't say that too loud because they might grab you back, which would be terrible. Uh, he has a book, which I think is just great, uh, called uh, Cyber War, A Political Economy of the Internet of Internet Freedom, 2015. And 
as well as 40 other publications which you can find all the uh, information online. Uh, but for our business, what I think you really should focus on is the reports of the uh, U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy, which I'm sure Sean will have more to say. Thank you very much for being here in our first joint effort, and thank you, Adam, again. Hey, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, can, can folks hear me in the back okay? That was a very lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, I did bring a few copies of our last report, which was called Can Public Diplomacy Survive the Internet? It's in the back. I brought about five copies, so I don't know if, if any are left. But it, it does have to do with um, public diplomacy in the age of fake news. It has to do with the future of public diplomacy in, in a world of computational engagement. And um, if you're interested in those subjects, the report is um, uh, uh, an aggregation of, of essays from folks at the State Department, including Jonathan Hennick, Dr. Hennick, who's sitting in the second row, but uh, uh, academics as well from around the world. So it's a really great publication. Um, thank you to Cynthia and Adam for the invitation to, to organize this panel. I'm really thrilled to have uh, three terrific panelists. Uh, the original theme, or one of the themes that was sort of pitched was 9-11, was 16 years later. And, and one of the things that struck me was thinking about public diplomacy in, in since 9-11, what's changed so much with the idea of digital diplomacy and, and how much we've adapted to a world of digital tools and digital strategy. One fun fact I want to mention is the, the first foreign ministry to establish a dedicated e-diplomacy unit was the U.S. Department of State in 2002. Um, that unit was very much internally focused on, on questions like how do we get digital tools accessible and um, available to diplomats around the world so they could be more effective at their job. Originally, e-diplomacy was thought of as a, a way to make us better at what we do, not in the cyber world, but uh, in the real world. And I think there's a lot of value to thinking about, about digital tools in that context still. From a governmental perspective, the State Department has been at the forefront of digital diplomacy since. And, and part of the reason why I'm so excited to have this panel is much of uh, the State Department's digital diplomacy efforts that the public learns about are um, usually critiques written in mass media about uh, a, a campaign gone awry. You know, I think the classic example that many folks in this room are familiar with is the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications Think Again, Turn Away campaign, uh, which was written about by a number of, of newspapers and journalists in, in very critical terms and, and in some ways um, scarred the face of digital diplomacy at the State Department. And, and part of the reason why I'm excited to have this panel is to have the opportunity to talk about all the accomplishments and all the excitement and innovative approaches to, to digital diplomacy that are going on right now that you probably have not heard of. Before turning things over to our panelists, I should note that uh, the Commission approaches digital diplomacy not simply as an effort to look at our social media accounts, but rather in terms of three different areas. The first is internet-driven changes in our communications environment. This is to say, how have technologies changed the ways in which we communicate the politics of social media platforms, the geopolitics of how information flows across borders, that is a component of digital diplomacy. The second piece is the emergence of new topics in the diplomatic ecosystem as a result of the emergence of, of the internet and uh, digital mobile technologies. This would include internet governance, uh, the rise of privacy as an issue in, in diplomatic matters, digital trade, for example. And the third area is uh, the use of digital tools in the practice of diplomacy, including social media platforms, bots, data, big data, and so on. So this taxonomy, uh, taxonomy encourages us to think about digital diplomacy not as simply the social media accounts or the tools, but the, the holistic uh, impact that digital tools are having on public diplomacy writ large. Uh, with this background in mind, I'd like to introduce today's wonderful panelists from the Department of State. Uh, Jennifer Lambert, who's directly to my right, is a foreign affairs officer and deputy director of the Bureau for International Information Programs Office of Analytics a presidential management fellow. She served as part of the Secretary of State's policy planning staff and worked in the Intelligence and Research Bureau focusing on Libya and Morocco. Jennifer's work includes social science research, target audience analysis, analysis digital strategy, and marketing to support the Department of State's digital outreach programs. She earned her PhD in political science at University College Dublin as a George J. Mitchell Scholar and was recently awarded Employee of the Year for her work at IIP. Luke Peterson is to her right. He is the director of IIP's Office of Analytics, where he is hard at work building the US government's capacity for data-driven global communications. 
recognized among Holmes Report's top 25 innovators uh, for 2015, Luke led Burson Marstella's analytics innovation group, delivering data-driven, audience-centric, integrated communications for clients like Bank of America and Oracle. Before joining the private sector, he served on four presidential campaigns as data management and micro-targeting experts. And to his right, we have Louisa Williams, a senior digital strategist in the Department of State's Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, Policy Planning and Resources Office, covering digital diplomacy issues. Some of her current projects include building a strategy for how public diplomacy should use computational engagement tools and technologies, coordination and development of digital crisis standard operating procedures, and assisting with the creation of the European Digital Diplomacy Exchange Program. Levisa is an early pioneer of digital diplomacy. She helped start the first social media office in the US government, the Office of Innovative Engagement, and she co-wrote the Department of State's first social media use policy. Levisa has served on temporary assignments in the White House and the Broadcasting Board of Governors. With, with that history, I'd like to start the, the session by asking Levisa to talk a little bit about the arch of the State Department's public diplomacy efforts how and when did we start uh, engaging in, in thinking about digital diplomacy seriously? What are the high and low lights? And how did we end up where we are? And where is that? Where are we right now? So thanks so much. Thank you, Sean. Hi. Um, so just we at the department have really been working in uh, digital or social media, as a lot of people know it by, uh, since about 2006. That's over 10 years. Uh, contrary to popular belief, we did not start social or media and digital here in Washington. As with most organizations, uh, innovation happens on the fringes of our organization. So it was really our posts who were leading us. They were saying to us, we need to use these tools. Why? Because this is where the people we need to engage with are. And that was sort of an eye-opening thing for us because of course at the time, we didn't think much of social media. We didn't think that we could possibly use these tools for government. Um, and then we started really seeing the results of those experimentations to the point where in 2008, International Information Programs Bureau put together the first social media office, which was the Office of uh, Innovative Engagement. This is the first time the US government said, this is an important topic. This is something where we need to figure out how do we do it the right way, why? Well, we have all these regulations and legal issues that private sector doesn't necessarily have to contend with. So we can't necessarily go out and just randomly use something, uh, even though it sounds like a great idea and it looks like it has a lot of great potential and possibilities. We have to be careful in how we experiment. And so we love sort of the idea that comes from private sector about experimenting uh, in small uh, ways and incremental ways so that we can learn from those experiences and build off of them. Uh, in 2010 is when we did the first social media use policy. So this was where we really started thinking about, okay, what are the rules of the road? Now that we've had some time experimenting with these tools and technologies, how people react to them, how we need to create content for these platforms, what does it take to run them in terms of resources, uh, thinking a little bit about the training implications for our staff and the funding issues, we now had this opportunity where we said, okay, we need to start putting things to paper. How do we help? our staff, both domestically and overseas, figure out how to use these tools. And that resulted in the first social media use policy, which is the 5FAM 790. Uh, so that was 2010. I'm happy to say that we are starting to put out the revisions to that policy. If you read it now, you'll see it's quite dated. We tried to do a good job at tea leaf reading of where technology is going to go in the future, as well as how is it going to impact the diplomatic mission, as well as public diplomacy. Uh, we thought at the time we were pretty innovative. Uh, looking back at it now, it's like, oh gosh, <laughs> maybe we didn't do such a good job on that. But we were one of the, the first agencies to have a fairly comprehensive policy. So that was a big uh, milestone for all of us. And since then, uh, we spent a lot of time experimenting with those tools in a very kind of standardized way. And uh, we have numerous guides and uh, guidance about how do you set up your accounts, how do you do that engagement, what kind of content works. Uh, and that's great. It's been a wonderful experience. We've also started doing a lot with capacity building. So we have formal training that the Foreign Service Institute does for us, as well as ad hoc training that both the regional bureaus and IIP help assist our post to ensure that uh, we're using these tools in the right way and leveraging to the best of their abilities. And it's not just uh, we have a strategy that's not just a centralized strategy, which a lot of large organizations has, but we have a very distributed strategy. And why we have a distributed strategy 
is because we recognize the fact that to leverage digital means to use it for its strengths. One of the main strengths is that you can customize content and engagement for the people you're trying to engage with. It wouldn't make sense for us in Washington to dictate to the field, you must do it this way. We would not be very successful. There are, of course, certain times when we need to do that. But we try to empower our posts to uh, recognize that they sh have the ability to customize content and those engagement experiences, whether it's for the platform or the tool or, or who they're trying to engage with based on their local knowledge. Um, so that's really important to us. While we may in, in Washington provide them with a structure and a framework for how we think those engagements should go, what kind of content might work, uh, we're really relying on the field to bring that engagement home and making sure that it's customized in the right way. Some of the things that uh, we have looked at in terms of challenges, like I said, are you know the, the governance frameworks and sort of the legal issues that surround our use of technology. This comes not just for US government, but for all governments who are trying to figure out how do I provide services to citizens, and yet at the same time be respectful for things like privacy and data collection, uh, First Amendment rights for us in the United States and such. Uh, probably one of the biggest things that we're looking at right now uh, is that we're focusing more on policy, this alignment of digital and policy. How do we integrate them together? This past spring, we just published the, uh, a PD uh, strategic framework. In this framework, we talk about four different areas. We talk about audiences. We talk about uh, strategy. We talk about effective management. And we talk about evaluation. How are all those four components part of the things that we do every day? Not just part of digital, but everything that we do as a public diplomacy professional. So we may be transitioning away from just focusing on tools and to this more holistic, strategic focus of how policy aligns and contributes to these tools. But we're also looking at the big changes that are happening right now in technology, such as big data. What's happening with big data? How is this huge amounts of data that we have access to and the tools that we have to do that analysis changing what we're doing? Um, the problems aren't necessarily different. Technology is changing how fast they grow and the sophistication of the things that are happening out there. But what we need to change is our business model, how we're approaching using these technologies, how policy integrates with them to making sure that we're going to be successful going forward. Thank you so much. That's a really good reminder, too, of just how digital is integral, not just to uh, technological approaches to PD, but to every single public diplomacy program. So exchange programs, for example, are, are you know human to human focus, but they also leverage uh, digital networks to organize alumni networks around them so their impact can be amplified. So digital has been truly integrated throughout the public diplomacy family. I'd like to turn now to, to Luke Peterson, who's the director of IIP's Office of Analytics, uh, and, and ask Luke to give us an overview of the types of, of services and, and analysis they offer uh, public affairs sections at post, so you can get a, a kind of a sense of the broad ar uh, array of programs that they're investing their, their, their resources in now. Sure, thanks, Sean. Um, so I'm going to pull up a slide deck for you to follow along, but before we get into that, I guess IIP broadly, you can think about it as being divided up into three different buckets. So you've got folks who create content, um, you know, writers, videographers, that kind of thing. You got folks who maintain the platforms on which that content can be presented. So the folks who run the embassy websites, um, for example, uh, with the speakers program. So we have people who can go out all over all over the world and um, deliver speakers to folks at Post. And then there's the uh, products or programs vertical where I sit, which is we think of it as sort of the glue that sticks our bureau to the folks at Maine State and to the missions. So we really figure out what folks at, at Post need and help transform that into the content and the platforms that that content goes out on. So when I sit down with our um, folks from embassies, I generally start with this presentation, which is something of a I don't know, catalog of services, what we offer to missions. So our office in particular is divided also into three groups. So you think large, big picture, it's um, marketing and strategic planning, uh, measurement and evaluation, and then consultation. And all the things that we're going to talk about here fall into each of those different groups. So 
up front, if you are having a, if you're, if you have questions about how do the audiences I'm supposed to be engaging with in my market, how are they consuming media? What platforms are they on? Um, what kinds of topics should we be engaging with them on? We, we've got a solution for that. If you're trying to figure out how to run an advertising campaign in order to make sure that the audience you're trying to reach is actually exposed to the content that you're trying to put in front of them, we can help you with that. Uh, if you are trying to figure out how to use search. So one of the primary ways people get information nowadays is they type a question into a you know, Google box and the information that comes back is generally the first, maybe the last thing that they're gonna read on that subject. So we wanna make sure that our content gets into that top result. We have a solution for that as well. Um, we start with media, what we call media landscape reports. And so this is just a very high level picture of where the, what, what a population is up to. So who is in this country? What is the age breakdown? What are the types of media, uh, what types of media are they using? So this would be a good example if you're thinking about running a uh, like Instagram campaign in Papua New, Gu New Guinea, and you know you find out okay, well it turns out you know 95% of people in Papua New Guinea don't have Instagram. Maybe you should think about having a radio program instead, which is actually how people you know get informed in that media market. We can help you determine that that is a pretty good decision in two pages or less. Uh, so we maintain those on all. Uh, it's a Every country that we're in, I think we, we may be missing a few, but we generally keep them up to date about every 18 months or so. So, you know, one of the questions that we get frequently from folks at Post is also, what, who is my mission reaching with our social channels? You know, Levisa just talked about how important it is that Posts have things like Facebook pages and, and uh, Twitter handles, but sometimes there's a disconnect between the audience Post would like to reach with those platforms and those mediums and the actual audiences that they're engaged with. So, you know, for example, if we go in and we look at Kosovo's Facebook page, and it turns out most of the people who are, who are fans of theirs are in Cambodia, then we can tell them that they need to make a pivot. That's not a real life example if you're taking notes, you know, we're not dramatically screwing up our, our Kosovo Facebook strategy. It's actually pretty good. But so in this case, the question is, okay, so for Ankara, Ankara's Facebook page turns out almost entirely uh, made up of Turks. Good, check that box. You know that the audience is at least in the right neighborhood, you know, globally speaking. Now let's make sure that we know that the content that we're putting out on that page matches the audience you've already got. And if the audience you've already got is not the audience you'd like to have, how can we tweak the content little by little to help build that audience that you do want and bring it and bring it in place? So we've got a bunch of different means to do that. Um, we can go in a little bit further in depth. So we've we ran an analysis here of at USA China Talk, which is um, Mission Beijing's Twitter handle to try to understand you know, who's following you. And what we learned very quickly, it's not, you know, Twitter is blocked by the Great Firewall. So there's some question about who are we actually talking to on this Twitter channel? Is it just diplomats? Well, it turns out it's actually a lot of uh, Chinese journalists. So when they tweet something on their embassy's Twitter page, it may not you know, hit the Chinese audience they're trying to reach, but it's hitting the reporters who write the content that then appears in the newspaper that in fact that audience that they're trying to reach ends up seeing. So we advise them, you know, based on this, it would make sense to make sure that you think about Twitter as, a, as a, essentially a parallel uh, press engagement platform. So that's the kind of insight that you can get by doing that sort of in-depth analysis to understand the relationships that you actually have with, with individuals. We do a lot of uh, media, digital, digital media and social media conversation analysis. So here's a, in a, in a screenshot, a good example was something that we were asked to do by Mission um, Dili. And so uh, Timor Leste, it's, uh, there's three languages that are covered in media. There's um, um, Portuguese, English, and Tetum, right? Who's, who's served there, yeah. So, so the, media, the media content, it, the, in particular, there was a conversation about maritime rights between Australia and Timor Leste. And it turned out that the, the conversation, the topics that were being discussed in media greatly differed depending on which language media you were looking at. So for Post, it was important for us to be able to tell, okay, you have three different segments. You know, I know your locally employed staff, of whom there are very few at that Post. 
but would tell you that there is a difference in, in these three languages. We can tell you quantitatively looking at this particular story over the course of two years, um, using natural language processing and other uh, machine learning techniques, that there is a serious quantitative difference in the conversations and, and the um, individual actors in each of those conversations that then informs them and their press engagement strategy. So we do stuff like that frequently. And so I say digital media, when I say digital media, I mean like newspapers that also put their stuff online, uh, which increasingly in many markets is becoming a standard. If you're publishing, if you're putting something into a computer to publish it into a newspaper, you might as well just put the article out on your website. And you see the same thing with a lot of television and radio folks who you know, write the script that is supposed to go on radio, they can pretty easily just copy paste it to their website. So by looking at those web platforms, in a um, holistic you know, longitudinal way allows you to come to some pretty interesting insights even about mediums that are not digital. And then social, obviously, it's a little bit more real time, it's a little bit less reliable. Um, also important to be able to assess. For us, we think about the, the primary juice that we wanna squeeze using these analytical tools that we have as being that digital media focus. Um, we talked about a little bit about advertising before so if you have a Facebook page you may notice as a, as a business that the your ability to reach your followers is diminished tremendously over the last few years it has diminished tremendously over the last few years Facebook is a business they see other businesses as being their primary revenue stream so they basically make it if you're an organization they make you pay in in order to actually reach the people even those who are following you and then certainly anyone who's not following you so if we have a specific message we're trying to deliver through social media to a specific audience on Facebook you pretty much have to use um, paid advertising in order to make that happen and so we at IAP have developed uh, a, essentially a procurement shortcut that allows us to do that kind of advertising um, which is sort of you know, hurdle number one in the State Department is figure out how to pay the payee um, in order to run that advertising. And then the second thing is the actual you know, strategy behind what should we do and why and when and how should we deploy it and what should we do to audience segment A versus B versus C. And so we've got the strategic uh, talent on our team also that can help make that happen. Uh, we, we do a fair bit of remote polling and survey work. So in that marketing and strategic planning bucket of, of um, services that we provide to posts, one of the things that we do kind of fits between what like an INR would do and what um, an open source pollster or other research company like a Pew might do in a particular place. You know, if you're, if you're sitting at post and you say, well, listen, you know, I've, I've looked at everything that Gallup and Pew and Transparency International and everybody else who publicly runs and releases their um, opinion surveys of my country say, I've looked at all the stuff that isn't public that we have access to, and there's a gap in knowledge. You know, I really need to know the answer to this one specific question about one specific audience or audience segment on a very specific issue. Then we have some tools that we can use to directly target and find out, take that temperature. Um, we ran under the last administration, there was a, a rather interesting um, program. Was, there was a, uh, a secretary's initiative called Operation Sea Scout that existed for many years. We found out that that was a trademark of the Boy Scouts of America, and we had to rebrand. And so the folks in the secretary's office came back to IIP, and they said, you know, you all are the creatives here in Washington. Can you come up with some good names? You know, L cleared on five alternative titles, um, but you guys, you'll come up with something better. I, I, I know it. And we said, well, how about counteroffer? What if we just did a poll asking of these five different names that have already been, you know, had a patent and trademark search done on them? How many of those are, or which, which of those seems to be the most, you know, characteristic of the um, traits we would like this organization to have? So we ran a remote survey of people in, I don't know, five or six countries around the world asking, you know, there is an organization in the world that defends um, maritime boundaries and fishing rights and all this other stuff, and what's it called? And then we listed the five names that had been pr approved by legal. And they overwhelmingly decided that uh, Safe Ocean Network, with the exception of one group, so like 60, 65 plus year old New Zealanders <laughs> thought that a different option was, was the best. But otherwise, so, so we were able to very quickly, and I think the turnaround on that was about three days, we told the secretary, you know, data says 
call it Safe Ocean Network, and then the Oceans Conference came out, and that was revealed as the new name of the program. So we can do that kind of thing pretty quickly, and usually pretty inexpensively, and we do so for Post quite often. We also, so also in this sort of niche space between what um, the intelligence community might provide and what we can get through open source uh, vehicles, we do a fair bit of focus grouping and in-depth interviews, so you know, good qualitative research to try to understand where audiences are coming from on particular issues to try to help us make sure that when we develop PD programming at Post, and this is always done in partnership with Post, and almost always by their request, um, that the messages that they're using, the platforms that they're pushing, the content that we're providing is all right in line, right, right what it's supposed to be in order to achieve the um, change in awareness or opinion or behavior that we're trying to achieve. Um, so we also have some data scientists and engineers on our team and you know what we find is we we do a, we do a pretty good job procuring software that's off the shelf commercial solutions that do the kinds of things that we need to do except every now and then the state department has a very specific need to fill an operational gap that we can't find a vendor to buy um like there's not a lot of analogs for example for the challenge that we have at IAP running share america which is shared.america.gov it's a a website that contains all of our digital content. Um, and it's very important for us to know, out of all of the embassies we serve, which ones are taking our content and sharing it on their um, Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or Weibo or um, other online presences. So you can't buy a tool that does that. We had to build one. Um, the downside to having engineers on your team is you have engineers on your team, and so if I'm going to write a memo, you know, I tell the uh, tell the engineers, so listen, I need to write a memo about, and they're like, hold on, give me like three weeks, and I'll write a piece of software that allows you to pr compose this memo and deliver it. I'm like, nah, we have like Word, and I don't know if WordPerfect is still installed anywhere at this day. It wouldn't surprise me, but anyway, so. Um, so we have to make sure that the engineers are always working to solve those problems that uh, have no commercial off-the-shelf solution for which it would just be better for us to buy. Um, okay, so hmm. we use a tool that I forgot to anonymize um, that allows us to assess the footprint of our embassy websites visitors. So we, if you run a website Every time someone clicks to your website, you, they send you information. Where are they coming from? How long are they there? How many pages do they go to? How, long, how far down the page do they scroll? Um, do they visit at 9 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock at night? Uh, which language version of the page are you clicking to? This content is really, really powerful, but it's also very dense. And if you're a time-strapped you know, PD cone person at post and you're trying to figure out how to use it, it's like, Difficult. So, so we at uh, IAP Analytics do a lot of work to sort of bring the data value directly to the folks who need to make decisions. So we presented. I think this this uh, screenshot was something we did for DCM again in Dili. I love using them as an example. Um, but it told them, you know, pretty quickly that the number one page visited on your embassy website is the one that uh, tells you where the employment opportunities are. So it's people prim primarily coming from visiting from Timor-Leste but looking for jobs. So that tells you, okay, maybe you're, you should have a PD engagement strategy that looks at planting some policy in your job descriptions, you know, where you're saying this is a thing that we're trying to accomplish or this is a program that we're trying to push or some awareness that we're trying to give of you because you know that that's where your audience is and that's what they're looking for. So we can very quickly um, deliver that and a lot of times, you know, it just helps folks have access to another set of answers um, that they wouldn't otherwise have. You know, I think this makes a, like an IG inquiry go much faster, for example, if you have this data at your fingertips, some of the questions that they may ask on you know, standard rounds, you can pull off this dashboard. Um, we also support, so one, one of the big issues and something that I, I'll get to later, um, for us you know, at IIP Analytics, there's like 18 of us in our office it's insufficient to support all of the needs of all of the missions out there. So we are working to make sure that instead of us doing all the work on behalf of POST, we're empowering POST to do work on their own. So we spend a lot of time doing training and consultations. When we do a procurement, it's usually a, procure a procurement 
that is flexible on the number of users so that we can think about deploying the tools that we use to people who need it and would use it wherever they're sitting in the world, whether they're LES, as long as they and, and are also like open net compliant, but things that people who sit in embassies actually can use to do their work. We try to make it pretty easy, pretty accessible, and we hold their hand to make sure that they've, they can use it. Um, that said, there's only 18 of us. And so obviously there's a long-term role for FSI to play and this kind of thing. But so we have some tools that we, that we provide. Um, some are focused on um, conversation analysis, digital media, and social analysis. It's the kind of thing that if you're running like a rapid response or media clipping entity at, at post, you can essentially have a computer pre-read all of the day's media for you and spit it out into a nice, easily digestible format. Um, we know we have people all over the world whose primary role for a big part of their day is read all the newspapers, write a summary about what happened, and send it to Washington. So, you know, I'm not saying that we should replace any of those jobs, but we certainly can make it so that a person can read, you know, using these machine learning tools, a thousand articles functionally instead of a hundred per day. Make them a lot more effective, a lot more efficient. Maybe give them a couple hours back that they can put toward more strategic work. Um, and then this is a tool that we give posts also that helps them understand the social media side of that window. So this, I think, is a screenshot of a dashboard we built for Mission Thailand that um, gives them, it shows them their social media data alongside the major news outlets in Thailand. So they can see at any given moment, you know, what are the people of Thailand who are on social media consuming? What do they find interesting right now? And then what was the last thing they found interesting that you wrote? And the idea here is it's, you know, it should be presenting to them in that middle column opportunities. If there's a way that you can take something that's in the news right now that seems like it's a conversation we can enter as the State Department, we can, we can join that conversation in an on-brand way in real time and catch that wave before it, you know, hits the beach. So, Sean, I hope that that's a thorough <laughs> that's great, yeah. delivery on, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I've asked uh, Jennifer Lambert to come up and actually talk about a couple of very specific uh, IIP uh, Office of Analytics campaigns. While she's getting her her slide set up, though, Luke, I was wondering if you could just give us a sense for for the scale of this operation. Like, how many um, how many posts do you help on a, an annual basis, roughly? I think all of them. Yeah. Um, we have a tracker that I run every every week that does a like a trailing 60 days on when was the last time we helped basically every mission and it's usually about two-thirds full so yeah so if you think about it, about every two months we touch two-thirds of missions there are probably some that we haven't helped in a while some places have more internet access than others Thanks. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, of course, when you're dealing with putting your public diplomacy strategy on digital and have digital content that you want to push out as part of that, those digital platforms can provide you with a wealth of data, right? They can tell you how many users on that platform you reached, how many users that you reached then actually took an action. But one of the things that those digital platforms can't tell you is whether or not your content actually had the desired attitudinal shift or b desired behavior change that you're trying to get that target audience to take or do, right? So we have prototyped a method for trying to test whether or not digital content actually has the desired attitude shift among the target audience that we're seeking to reach. So I'm going to walk you through a couple case studies. The first one is part of a, let's see. What is that? It's trying to measure content that IIP produces in Russian. And the desired target audience are young Russians online. And the desired objective or outcome is to improve measures of trust and affinity with Americans, right? So the idea behind the content is in part, what Luke will talk about in a minute, it's part to support an inoculation strategy, 
but designed to take that target audience and make their attitudes towards the United States just a little bit better. So that if they hear content or they're exposed to content that criticizes the United States, they might be a little bit less likely to believe it and share it with their networks. Right. So for this particular program, I just walked you through the main objectives of it, but we actually sent a video team out to California to film this Russian rock band that was brought over on an ECA program. And so we took a lot of B-roll, we chopped the B-roll up into short, socially shareable chunks that then can be used by our missions in the field who are communicating with young Russian speakers online. Right. So what we really wanted to learn is whether or not exposure to this video and consumption of it actually promoted an improvement in measures of trust and affinity with Americans. And we learned that on two of the four measures we were testing, it actually did. So here's just a little bit for those of you who are interested in some social science approaches to digital diplomacy. Um, what we did was we had a random domain intercept technology platform. It basically captured individuals who typed the wrong address into the address bar on their web browser who were located in the target areas that we were trying to target. We then screened the individuals that were captured for those who spoke primarily and engaged primarily online in Russian language, were ages 18 to 40, and that they were active on one of the four platforms in which this content could be delivered to that particular audience. So they had to be active on at least one of Facebook, Twitter, vcontactia, or OK, which is another sort of classmates.com version <laughs> that became popular in Russia. Then that particular group is randomly assigned to either a control group that does not see the video or a treatment group that does actually see the video. And here we had two units of analysis. We wanted to see if we could move opinions of young Russians in Russia. So if you were a young Russian speaker located inside Russia, you could be either in the Russian control group or the Russian treatment group. And then we treated the Russian periphery or the Russian near abroad, the former Soviet states, as another unit of analysis. Because we wanted to see if we produce content in Russian designed to move opinions of young Russians, can it also move the opinion of young Russians located in Estonia or Georgia or Latvia, right? And then we asked those groups the same questions designed to measure sort of me or provide measures of trust and affinity for this particular experiment. So what we learned was that young Russians located in Russia who saw the video were 33% more likely to say that people in the United States have values like mine. Right. And we also learned that young Russians in Russia who saw the video, 17% more of them we're likely to say that Russia should increase its political, economic, and cultural ties with the United States. And here's just an example of the actual raw data, right? So this is talking about Russians. Our sample size was about 1,200. And so we saw within the control group, the difference between the control group and the treatment group to statistically significant measures of change. When you dig down into the actual audience segments, we saw that that change was driven by largely males and particularly young males, right, 18 to 25 and 26 to 30. Which should come as no surprise if you remember the video, who are our messengers, right? They're young men. And so this particular video tended to improve the opinions of young men. So that sort of at, that brought up a number of questions for us that we would like to test further, right? If we change the messenger, if we used women, would that alter receptivity to the video? Would we be more successful in moving the opinions of women? If we use older messengers, would we be more likely to move the opinion of older members of that particular target audience? We also looked at, remember I was talking about we had a unit of analysis for the Russian periphery, right, for former Soviet states. We did not detect a statistically significant difference between the control and treatment group in former Soviet states. So does that mean if we want to reach young Russian speakers, 
outside of Russia, do we have to use a messenger that's known to them? Do I have to use an Estonian rock band to reach young Russian speakers in Estonia? Or a Latvian messenger to reach young Russians in Latvia? Right? We also noticed in the data that for those who watch the video, their attitudes and measures of trust and affinity with all other groups tested improved, right? Which opens up a series of sort of strategic options to you. Could we have, you know, a piece of content with Russians who are traveling in Brazil and talking about their experience and getting along with Brazilians, and that has secondary effects on their opinion about Americans, right? That's of interest. And you'll notice on this particular video, we did not have any branding, right? Most of our digital content has the Share America brand or the flat United States sort of State Department's uh, icon, right? So in this, we did not, we stripped it of the branding because we just really wanted to test the message and the content. Well, if we put that branding back in, does that make a difference? Does that mean that you then alter receptivity? How are we doing on time? Really okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd ask Jen to present two case studies, but because we only have about 10 minutes left, if you don't mind, maybe we yeah. can save the second case study for Q&A. Sure. Okay, so before Absolutely. I turn things over to the audience, I, I, I wanted to invite Lavisa to briefly talk about um, some work she's been doing on uh, the State Department's approach to computational engagement. I, you all have, have likely heard quite a bit about the dangers of machine-driven and artificially intelligent bots propagandizing the world with disinformation. Um, but there's also another side to this. How can these technologies be used to make our jobs better, more efficient, and us more effective communicators? And Lavisa has been working on, on these issues quite a bit. So if you wouldn't mind giving us a brief answer, and then we can open it up. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so first off, computational engagement. Yes, new term. Uh, the thing with technology is we always have new vocabulary. Uh, computational engagement is actually something that we coined and we really see it as any way that you can use uh, some form of automation for engagement with the public. So that covers some of the things that uh, Jen and Luke have spoken about as well as other initiatives. Uh, so some of the things that we're seeing uh, de uh, developing that are really exciting are with um, you know, machine driven engagements in terms of like chatbots and stuff. So you've probably seen some of these if you've gone to an e-commerce site and you've had to, uh, you know, that little box pops up and says, if you have a question, ask me kind of thing, right? Well, we're seeing that they're becoming much more sophisticated. In fact, Consular Affairs is doing a pilot project right now with GSA on how to find your local passport office. That's really exciting. Well, what else could we do with that kind of technology that's available today to help provide better customer services to citizens or general information to the public? Uh, another thing that could be really interesting is, um, like I said, a lot of what Luke and Jen have already started with on their team of all this data that we have, how do we better make use of it? How do we make it more valuable? Governments have been collecting information for thousands of years. The problem has been that we've never been able to sort through it and make it valuable to us and be able to make it actionable. So you'll hear this concept that we talk about a lot about data-driven decision-making. Well, that's really what we're talking about. How do we use data to better make decisions, to better understand our impact uh, to the public and other places, whether it's through advertising, whether it's better content. Uh, some of the things that are you know, on the horizon that we're really interested in are the fact that machine translation is evolving very quickly. Um, so you'll even see now when you're trying to translate something online with Google Translate or Bing, it's gotten better. It's going to increase that. So we could potentially see cost savings uh, because right now, as you know, we use a lot of human translators because we're talking about very sensitive things like policy. Could we augment that with some form of machine translation? If so, what kind of cost savings could we potentially see? Um, same thing with content creation. We invest a significant amount of time and money into creating custom content uh, and then making it in a form where our posts and embassies can customize that even further for very specific audiences. So if we have a machine that can help us do that, um, I think there's a lot of really interesting possibilities that could come forth from that. But as always, we have to keep in mind the fact that we have these governance and legal frameworks that we have to work within, um, you know, privacy, data collection, intellectual property, security issues, as you all probably saw with the Equifax stuff. Um, we still care about that, and it's something that 
um, we take very seriously. Um, so it's balancing those things as we move forward. Uh, but there's still lots of great promises and opportunities for the good side of these tools. Um, and I think that's something we can't ignore. That was great. And thanks for, for cramming it in in a pretty <laughs> short period there. Um, we do have um, just under 10 minutes uh, of time for q and I know that's not a ton, but maybe we could take two or three questions from the audience and then circle back to the panel for responses. And uh, please uh, wait for the mic for those who are watching on YouTube and uh, identify yourself if you could when you begin your question. Uh, I'm Mike Schneider with the Maxwell School of Syracuse University, USIA alum. I, uh, this is fascinating and I'd like to explore it in greater detail with you, but I'm curious how you fit in the larger pattern of the Department of State's using technology, for example, e-diplomacy or uh, INR. Are you primus inter pares in the in the realm of analytics and then production of of standards and and management of content for not just public diplomacy but all the rest i'll start <laughs> um i would say that you know one of the advantages of public diplomacy is we are very much uh looking at what our audiences want uh, so from that perspective, we're really the pioneers. We're the ones who kind of push the rest of the department to be aware of the changes that are happening in our environment. Uh, therefore, the tools and the, and the, the best practices and the guides and the everything else that we create um, are actually really valuable for other parts of the department beyond public diplomacy. Uh, so Consular Affairs obviously is a great partner with us. Um, they really appreciate the fact that um, you know we're paving the way and, and doing the hard work of writing some of these policies and we work in close conjunction with them and we really see that you know as much as we're doing this for our own community we recognize that other people can benefit for it and we do try to partner with other parts of the organization in order to ensure that where possible uh, we can accommodate their business needs we work with them as well in fact uh, right now we're working on how to better standardize data distribution uh, and packaging content so that it gets to post in a timely manner Peter Kovach, a member of both of these distinguished organizations. My question is, and it's based on some rough experience last summer filling in as a PAO at a post that I'll leave nameless. How is this managed at post, uh, taking the, the great research resources that uh, I had a great IIP briefing before I went out, uh, but I just found that local staff and American staff and the interaction over what we actually put out was really scrambled. And then you have the front office with its own ideas. Yeah, I'd say it depends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, you think about large scale organizational transformation, it really has to start with resourcing, training, making sure that there is a way that we can say that everyone who goes through A100 from now until the end of time is equipped with the skills that they need to be able to make this stuff happen at scale at post. I don't think there's ever going to be a world in which the Washington-based resources are going to be able to you know, do this work for every post or support them. It's just not going to happen. So for us, you know, in, in my sort of ideal future state of our office, it's where we move away from being the strategic practitioners ourselves and move into a place where we're providing support, providing training, enabling folks on the ground to do the work where it matters. And where they frankly have more, I mean, I have to get myself briefed up. I sit for you know, three hours with INR before I start on a project because I have no ground knowledge of what's going on in a country. And that doesn't get me anywhere near into the level of immersion that folks who are actually sitting there have. Um, so it's just better done on the ground. Um, Mike Anderson, retired uh, FSO. Where does traditional face-to-face -face communication come in from the perspective of the field and are any of your offices asking post to report on those so-called traditional contacts one-on-one -on -one, whatever they might be or is that gone by the wayside in light of um, social media and what's the mix so, so I'll say so, so there's a thing called CRM. 
<laughs> it's a uh, contact relationship management system that IIP has been piloting. You know, we talk about the digital platforms we manage from IIP. It includes the uh, embassy websites, Google Drive, Slack, a bunch of things that are you know modern tools for doing business that we're integrating slowly around the department and leading from our bureau. Although you know, who knows what the what the redesign may yield um, I over the long term. But so. CRM is a, essentially a digital knowledge man management platform that we've been piloting with a bunch of posts so far. And this, the whole thing is designed to bridge the in-person knowledge, um, you know, the, who you had lunch with this week and what they tweeted last night and you know, what events they've been to and all that other stuff. So you can have a 360 degree view of the people you're trying to maintain relationships with. And as, as folks who served at Post know that's so important, especially as people transition, you know, having all that knowledge rest only with the LES over a long period of time is is complicated. Um, and so being able to go into a system where you're able to pull that information out and see what, you know, the last IO at Post was, do, was doing with reporters X, Y, and Z is a uh, super useful tool, we think. And so we're working pretty hard to partner with a bunch of posts to make that, make that deployment happen. So in terms of reporting and such, uh, we still believe that face-to-face -face is the primary way that, and the best way to connect with anybody. Um, digital is a great way to augment that and extend that kind of engagement. And so that's how we view it. Um, we also have, first off, we still continue to ask for those cables to be sent in telling us what happened with your PD programs, what were the results of your PD programs. We find those extremely valuable. And so we just continue to encourage posts to do those. Um, through Ripper, we have two great tools. Uh, one of them is PDIP, so this is the PD implementation planning process. It's an annual process. We still ask that you include digital as well as all your traditional PD programs and planning in that document on an annual basis, and then report out via MAT. Um, so that's the Mission Activity, activity Tracker. Um, we say not just digital, but we want it all. In fact, we don't want digital separate out as a separate kind of activity. We want to see it integrated into the things that you're already thinking about. And when you're planning your activities, we want to see that there is some kind of digital pro uh, component. It's okay to say it doesn't apply in this particular case, but we at least want to know that you've considered it as one of the options on the table. I would also say it's not only a way of like continuing the conversation, but sometimes it can be a way of enabling a face-to-face -face sort of public diplomacy engagement. So within IIP, we also have the Office of American Spaces, right? We also have an Office of Virtual Programming. We do a lot of virtual programming that takes advantage of expertise in Washington or expertise in the field through our speakers program that then makes that speaker and expertise available virtually to a group of young students in an American center, right? We also run networks, right? We have the YALI network, which started as a digital platform to bring together young leaders in Africa. And we now have a Facebook group for them to get together and organize their own events. We've even had YALI members get married, <laughs> right? So like the digital platform becomes a way in which it enables, right, that face-to-face -face connection. Yes. Hi. Sorry. Yes. Um, I, my name is Nancy, um, and I'm from WJLA. I, I just find all of this so fascinating to listen to, and I wanted to ask about the flip side of all of this. Uh, I know a lot of reporters here in D.C. follow Russia and USA, uh, the account, the Twitter account of uh, the Russian embassy here, and it can be oftentimes very tongue in cheek, especially after a lot of big events, a lot of big uh, diplomatic events. And I wanted to see how much you monitor those accounts that are here in the United States and how, if that does affect your missions and your campaigns. Yeah, we absolutely do, because um, it impacts the conversation, right, that we're having. Um, one of the things that we have done is work very closely with our partners in Embassy Moscow, for example. Um, and they have to monitor the conversation happening on both sides of the Atlantic in both languages, you know, constantly watching for things that are inaccurate and have an impact on our bilateral relationship or the business of what's going on at Embassy Moscow. Uh, and sometimes we've helped them catch things, like there was the example where uh, a 
Russian backed or Kremlin backed media outlet, I believe it was, had photoshopped an image of our ambassador at an opposition protest in an effort to discredit that protest. And the embassy was able to capture that conversation and respond to it with humor in a way that sort of really negated the message that they were trying to send, right? They had an image of Ambassador Teft at the moon landing, right? And, and Ambassador Teft at the D-Day invasion, right? As a way to kind of make fun of what was happening there. Um, so monitoring conversation is definitely part of the tool because that they're affecting the space that we're engaging in, right? So you, you have to do that. Um, and it's also, I have to say, outside of IIP, we have other public diplomacy partners who engage in m ways of trying to embolden civil society and train local actors who can also do some of that work and have a different kind of credibility with the audiences that we're trying to inoculate or communicate with or engage with. And so that's also a key component of that that often isn't talked about, but is, is very important. Hi, I'm Claudia Agnasso, and I retired in 2009 from AFPD as their director. And I tell you, this is so fascinating. I'm just gobsmacked. I just, if I had to die and come back, I'd work for IIP. <laughs> but, but, but in those days, we were sort of doing a lot of counterterrorism stuff, trying to engage those young people who were being uh, engaged by others. And I was wondering, where does the counterterrorism piece, where does that fit now? I didn't hear anything like that from you guys. Is there somewhere that that's going on? So um, I, I think there's quite a bit of, of counterterrorism and CVE work being conducted throughout the public diplomacy cone, but one of the primary actors is the Global Engagement Center, uh, the GEC, um, who's not here today, unfortunately, uh, but they do use quite a bit of, of technological tools, some of the same tools you've heard about today, some other tools because their mission is a bit broader and a bit different, um, but I guess the answer is yes, and hopefully we can, we can get some Global Engagement Center representatives uh, to talk about how they approach these issues, I think very s in a very similar way, but they also have a slightly different mandate, um, and they're actually legally allowed to use tools in ways that IIP is not, um, based on some legislation that passed in 2016, so. Yeah, so just like somebody was talking about functional bureaus earlier and how we support them, so just, just like functional bureaus, when GEC asks us for help with something, we help. Um, and it happens pretty often. And in GEC's case, on the analytics front, we do a lot of work out of our office to make sure that they have access to the same tools as we discussed before. You know, we go out and we make sure that we can get seats for, for these products for post to have. There are folks over at GEC who have access to the same tools and they have 100% you know, support and dedication from, from us in being able to use them to achieve their mission. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. And I'll make it quick, but thank you for a wonderful panel. This has been great. Dan Srebny, um, retired public diplomacy officer now at FSI. Um, State Department, I, IIP, and the regional bureaus aren't the only ones with social media engagement with foreign audiences. There are numerous bureaus having multiple, and there are numerous other agencies who are reaching out to foreign audiences who also have multiple channels. And then there's Congress, there's the White House, there are state and local governments all reaching out. I know you have a lot of personal contacts across the, all of these uh, organizations, but how, what is the formal setup for, in the military terms, to coordinate, synchronize, and deconflict on the executive branch side, but to have, you know, but also to inform our missions abroad and other parts of the State Department as to who is also reaching out to those audiences? Because those audiences see all of this is coming from the United States. Thank you. Well, so one thing we can talk about that our office is working on, has been working on for some years, is this big um, digital communications um, analytics dashboard database. Right now, we are tracking uh, in, in pretty much real time 2,400 different social accounts, Facebook, Twitter, 
Instagram, others that are being run by various State Department entities. There's work underway to have that database be extended to track USG properties around the world because you know I think DOD would tell you that they their visibility stops at a certain level. Um, the national parks exist and have the same need. Part of it is is legal. You know, every single officially run social media handle has to deal with Records Act issues. So like archive, archiving. So when you when you see a government entity delete a tweet, for example, that's actually you know violating a, a U.S. records laws unless they've officially archived it somewhere. So we're trying to solve that problem at IAP. Again, you know, this goes back to what I was saying about having some engineers and data scientists. Sometimes it becomes a dangerous thing. We realize that this tool that we built to serve the State Department is now something that can actually extend to serve the rest of government as a whole. So we're working on that with GSA. Um, as far as how we coordinate, you know, in other ways, I think, we, you know, we do a lot, like I said, uh, other parts of government reach out to us often when they find out what we have. Sometimes people come over to our office just to use the Wi-Fi. Uh, but I'll let, I'll let others talk about the more formal way in which that exists. Okay. Um, so as you guys know, uh, the interagency process is cumbersome at best. Uh, unfortunately, it still is, unless you get on an IPT. Um, you know, it can be very long, arduous. Uh, it's a lot of personal connections, nine times out of ten. Uh, sometimes I applaud my other government colleagues because they seem to know sometimes more about what we're doing than our own government does. Uh, so they come over fairly frequently for consultations, uh, which has been a wonderful resource and a great way for sometimes for us to set up ways that we can collaborate together. Uh, but on the post side is actually where we're really doing a lot more uh, because we're looking at this concept of whole of mission. So what does that mean? For us, that means how do we get state, specifically the public affairs officer with the Im support from the ambassador and the DCM, to help coordinate all the USG activities that are happening for the mission? Who's doing what? What are they saying? Where are they saying it? Uh, and how do we better coordinate those activities so that they make sense? So it used to be that every individual agency may have had their own Facebook page, Twitter page, everything else. We recognize that that's probably not the best approach. Uh, we're trying to cut down on the number of Facebook pages, for instance, that are in Bangkok for all of USG. Um, that doesn't necessarily make sense unless we have very distinct audiences that are very separate for some reason. Uh, so we're trying to consolidate those and figuring out uh, because the other problem is it's expensive to maintain staff who have the expertise as well to run these communities. Community management is a very specific skill set and it takes a lot of time and effort. So if we can have policy officers and other agencies focus on their specific subject matter expertise in developing content and doing the engagement then and not have to worry about the back end management of these communities, I think that's really an advent, uh, advantageous to all of us. Well, finally, a quick question for Sean. A, a couple of you asked, um, uh, where's Matt Chesson? So uh, if uh, this may, may be in the uh, category of CNN with labels breaking news, but uh, why don't you tell us where Matt is? I'm I'm, and I'm so, I should have mentioned this earlier. Matt, of course, wanted to join us. He's, he loves talking about these issues, uh, but his wife went into labor on Thursday. And uh, so he is a new father, and as many of you know, very, very busy right now, and probably not physically or mentally able to be on a panel. But we'll, we'll circle back, and, and he sends his regrets. Well, thank you to uh, the four of you who made it for a fascinating uh, session. Please. <laughs>